All right, welcome to your Aunt Brooke show, and today we're talking about robots. They are coming, the robots are coming, and they're going to take all of our jobs. And uh, by the way, according to Bill Gates, we should also tax them because, you know, we, we have to do something with, uh, well, we have to slow them down. When you tax something, do you get more of it or less of it? You get less of it. So uh, if we tax the robots, we'll get less robots. Maybe that's what Bill Gates wants. He wants us to slow it down because the robots are coming and they're going to take all our jobs. And what are we going to do if you think people are alienated today, if you think people are frustrated today, if you think the Chinese have taken our jobs? Imagine what happens when the robots take our jobs. I mean, it's it's like a thousand times worse. The, the Chinese are nothing as compared to uh, to the coming robots. Um a lot of uh, a lot of panic, a lot of hysteria out there. We need a basic universal income. Pay everybody, because uh, soon they won't have anything to do. There won't be any jobs for them. So we need to make sure that they have some income, because the robots are coming and they're going to take our jobs. All right. So uh, today we're going to try to unpack the whole question of uh, robots and the impact they have, um, both uh, economically. Uh, so we'll do it a little bit of uh, economic analysis of this, uh, the phenomena. Phen- phen- <laughs> you see, Karen, you've you've got me stuck now on uh, on you know, am I saying it right or not? This is an inside joke, but uh, um, <laughs> so uh, we're going to discuss uh, we're going to discuss uh, you know what robots, uh, what kind of impact they're going to have on our on our lives, and uh, both from an economic perspective. That is, uh, just from a sheer jobs perspective, what do jobs look like? Um, do jobs really go away? Uh, what kind of new jobs would would there be? What happens to people who are unskilled? In general, what happens? And and what about all this hysteria? And what about all this uh, the panic uh, that is out there that really does exist? I think people are really worried about this. We really haven't seen anything like it in terms of the worry, and I think it's going to get worse, much worse, partially because people can't think. So so much worse over the next 10, 20 years. Think about the, the panic hysteria, irrationality with regard to trade and with regard to automation, with regard to China that emanates from, from the Trump administration and is picked up by so many Americans today. Robots are, are a much more dramatic thing than, than anything China has done in terms of the potential effect on your life. Uh, so think about the hysteria today over stuff that I think trade, uh, specialization, uh, different countries specializing, comparative advantage, all these economic issues that were kind of resolved 200 years ago and that we know the answers to and there's no there's no question that, for example, the trade is good. There's no question that... that uh, that the automation we've seen through the 19th century and into the 20th century has been good. But that, in spite of that, in spite of the fact that we've resolved all those questions, in spite of the fact that we have answers to all those problems, in spite of the fact that there's not a single legitimate or semi-legitimate economist who believes that free trade is bad, in spite of all that, it's still true that so many Americans think it's bad and, and that the that the president of the United States and and uh, m- many within the governing authorities of the United States today think that it's bad. So um, it, now that's something we've already we've had for 200 years. We've understood for 200 years. Economists have been writing about for 200 years. Then flip it to something new, something we don't completely understand, something that involves a lot of uncertainty because we, we don't really know how it's going to develop, how it's going to evolve. And something that, uh, you know, is on top of the hysteria that's involved with trade and, and regular automation, now robots. And, uh, you know, what are you going to get? You're going to get much worse, I think. And this is going to become politicized. And it's the Luddites are going to come out in full force. And I fear that, that the Luddites might have, unless we really do the educating and we start the educating early, the Luddites, Luddites are uh, people who, who, since the early 19th century, have objected to technology, have always claimed that technology is going to destroy jobs, have always claimed that technology is, uh, is, is bad for the human soul, for the human spirit, for the human uh, ability to, 
produce for himself. They've always complained that no matter how much success automation has had, no matter how much progress automation has made, it seems like they're always Luddites and, and there are always people who uh, reject that and, um, and abandon that. So, uh, so we're, we're talking robots today, we're talking uh, this trend, but I also want to talk about the, uh, you know, the ethical implications of this. What does this mean for individual human life? What does it mean? What kind of responsibility does that imply on you as a human being? Um, how should you as an individual relate to robots? How should you as an individual think about um, the actual work uh, that you do? And what do robots imply for your individual life? So I want to take kind of a macro economic perspective, but then much more importantly, I want to drill down to a micro individual perspective. What does this have, what impact does this have on you? as an individual, and uh, what responsibility do you have towards your own life, and how does, uh, how does robotics or robots, how do they, how do they impact that? And, uh, you know, it, it, there's nothing new here in the sense that your responsibility to your own life uh, is not changed by the existence of robotics, but the, but the, uh, the time scale, the urgency of about thinking about certain issues the urgency of understanding what productiveness actually means, I think, is to some extent accelerated by robotics because they're going to change your life. It, robots are going to change your life. Unless, unless you're on the verge of death, unless you're going to die in the next 10 years, uh, robots are going to change profoundly the way we live over the next 20 years and certainly over the next 100 years. So anybody who's out there who's a teenager, your life, your career, uh, the things that you land up doing, is going to be profoundly affected by by uh, the robotics revolution. Of course, all this assumes that civilization continues and we don't all spiral into some dark ages um, and uh, and the end of life as we know it. You know, but let's make that optimistic, benevolent assumption um, for the purposes of this show. Ro robots are coming and they're going to be really, really cool. All right, you can call in. Uh, if you have any uh, any thoughts about this, I mean, this is going to be the main topic we talk about. I've got a couple of other things uh, I want to discuss um, as well, uh, you know, and, and uh, so that relate to uh, that relate to ethics, that relate to what it means to be an egoist and what it means to be selfish, and that that'll fit nicely into part of the show. But uh, I got a an email critical of my uh, claiming that sharing is bad, so. Uh, uh, I want to respond to that, and it, it, should, it should raise some, some interesting questions. So feel free to call in if you have any uh, questions about uh, or if you have any comments or have any concerns about the coming or, or ongoing robotic revolution, 347-324-3075, 347-324-3075. By the way, we're also broadcasting on Facebook Live, so if you want to see video of me standing in um, – in my new office and uh, doing this, so in my home office, if you will, and, and doing this, then you can watch on Facebook Live. By the way, there is a, you know, if, if you're on Facebook Live and there's a little sculpture in the back there, uh, that is uh, that is a sculpture of Thomas Jefferson, which I bought my son years and years ago, and it's, this is, uh, this room is his old bedroom. Uh, so, Robots. Well, why don't we start with a phone call? We've got somebody's very eager to talk. All right, you're new on Bookshow. Who's this? Hi, this is Jennifer from Michigan. Hey, Jennifer. How's it going? Good. How are you? Good. Good. Um, I was thinking, you know, like you said, this is nothing new. People have always reacted this way when there's been new machines come out. And I was trying to figure out why they would act like that. And at first I thought well, maybe they're just lazy and they don't want to change and learn new things. But I was thinking it's a specific kind of laziness because it's it's not really physical laziness. Because, like, if I gave you a shovel and you gave me a shovel and told us to dig a hole, we would know how to do that That's, unless we're, like, really weak or something, we could dig a hole. Yep. But if you told me to go in, like, a steam shovel and run it, I wouldn't know how to do that. Yep. You have to learn how to think new things, and that's the problem. People don't want to think, and that's not good, obviously. That's where they're being lazy. And yeah, no, much I, more I, dangerous, I think, than physical yeah, I, I definitely think you're right. So, so and I'll get to that kind of in the second part of the show is, is that 
or, or soon I'll get to that. It, it, it is, it places more personal responsibility on you to dictate the path of your life. So when you're born into, into a subsistence farm and all you have to do is, is, is work from sunrise to sunset and you put the seeds in the ground and, you know, whatever it is you do in farms, I, I don't know, you, you, you collect eggs or whatever. And, and basically you're living off of that and that's all you do and it's a horrible life, but it's all you do. And, and suddenly there, there are very few choices the very, very few decisions you have to make. There's indeed very little thinking you have to do. There's some thinking, but there's very little thinking. Suddenly, right. you have a lot of thinking to do. And, and I think the more we automatize our environment, the more we automatize our work, the less uh, repetitive it becomes, the less, um, uh, you know, the less automated it becomes for us as human beings, and the more free time we have, but also the more choices we have in terms of our profession, in terms of, and our profession now becomes, all of the professions become, professions where the essential characteristic of that profession is your ability to think, to choose, to decide. So it requires an ability to decide and to think and to choose. Whereas in the past, if you worked on an assembly line, there were no choices. You pulled the lever. You pulled the lever every few seconds. You pulled the button. You did. You tighten the screw, whatever it is that you did. There were no choices. There were no decisions. Uh, and, and yes, and, and there's a, that, that appeals to a certain laziness of people, but it's worse than laziness. It's, it's, not, it's not applying that which is uniquely human, which is the decision-making, the free will, the capacity to think, the capacity to I I invent, the capacity to do something new that didn't exist before. And that is what robots make possible, and that's why robots are such a huge benefit to mankind huge benefit to us it's because they free us up to do more of what is uniquely human which is to think and and, right, and, and like at whatever iq level laundry. you have right at whatever iq i shouldn't use iq level or whatever intelligence level <laughs> you have. Yeah. go ahead go ahead right instead of taking three days to do the laundry like it used to take we're watching some show about tudor england it used to take three days just to wash like yeah. the linens in the house yeah it's like what you what you could invent in three days and just yeah. throw it in the washer, and you could think of all this cool stuff like airplanes and stuff in three days. Yeah, but put aside, put aside the washer. You Imagine manage. you can say, uh, you can say, what, there's, there's a robot. What's, you know, you could say, um, what's a good name for a butler? There has to be a, a, a good name for a butler. Yeah, Jeev. Hey, Jeev. <laughs> uh, you know, do the laundry. And, and, and the robot <laughs> takes the laundry and does it, and does it better than you because it could identify the stains on the clothes because it could, could, could look every milli, milli inch, uh, milli inch is wrong, a milli, a milli, uh, millimeter <laughs> of clothing and, uh, and really look and find every little stain and every little piece of dirt and it can correct it and put it in the washing machine or it could do, or maybe it is the washing machine. I don't know. And it would, it would, it would do your laundry. And, um, you know, it, it's so, so it's even more. You don't have to even pick up the laundry. You don't have to put it in a machine. You don't have to worry about it. Now you can really think big thoughts, and you can think about. You have much more time to think the big thoughts. You have much more time to do all that. So, so it's it's the the kind of things that we're talking about. But but that's the laziness you're talking about. It's people who don't want to engage in that thinking, and 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 that's something I really want to talk about because I think it's relevant for all of us. This idea of of thinking and what to think about and and what we need to do to prepare for the age of robots. All right, thanks for calling. Yeah. Really appreciate it. Thank Good you. to hear from you, as always. And it was nice seeing you in, uh, in Chicago, what was it, a week ago? Um, you know, okay, we got somebody else. Hi, you're new on Book Show. Who's this? Yep. Go ahead. Uh, hello, this is Eric. Eric from New Hampshire. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes, I can. But speak up. Okay, great. Um, yeah, you, you must have read my mind. I was thinking about asking you this question uh, recently, uh, both AI and robots. I've been thinking a lot about this this topic because I agree with you. This is going to have huge impact upon society in many ways that we can't even imagine right now. Um, <clears throat> did you read the recent, I mean, did you watch the recent interview by Mark Cuban? He talked about this and he talked about uh, many people will lose their jobs yep. due to um, robots yeah. and AI. And, and one, one, one thing, one type of job I was surprised that he mentioned was programmers. Yep. Because uh, you know, 
uh, coming back from China, I was teaching English, and now I want to get into programming, maybe go back to college, but I'm afraid if I do that, and then I graduate, and then, you know, uh, you know, then it, I won't be able to find a job. Sure. So, um, well, what do you I think mean, about... I did not do, see the do, interview, do with Kubrick, think... but he's absolutely right. I mean, some programming jobs, not all mm-hmm. programming jobs, but some programming jobs, which mm-hmm. are which are easily learned by AI. And, and again, AI, artificial intelligence, I'm not implying that robots or the, the computers have intelligence. They have the ability to mimic intelligence. They have the ability to do certain tasks and they have the ability to learn in some ways. So there's a certain sense in which they can learn. So, um, mm-hmm, right. so they, they, yeah, they yes, they, absolutely. They, some programming is already being done uh, in a, by by uh, by machines, and and that will only increase. And uh, yes, millions and millions and millions of jobs. This this is the prediction. The prediction is, and this is I'm making this prediction, and I think this is pretty safe to say, seventy to ninety percent of all the jobs human beings do today, seventy to ninety percent of all the jobs people do today, will be done mm-hmm. or will either not exist or be done by machines in a hundred years. So 70 to 90 percent of all the jobs. Yeah. So, yes, yeah, so hundreds of millions well, of jobs. I, I would say less. What's that? I would say less than less. I would say less than 100 years. I, I think this is going to happen very soon. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's quite I don't think it's quite year. as fast as, as many people predict, because I think this is much harder than many people predict. I mm-hmm. think this is much more challenging. Yeah. So it's true yeah. that millions of yeah, jobs that's, that's... will be replaced mm-hmm. over the next 20 years, but hundreds of millions mm-hmm. of jobs will be replaced over the next over the next hundred years. So what's the question? Well, well think about that. Um, so my question well, is, so what? Just, mm-hmm. Yeah, it, well, no, I, I agree with you. Yeah, I, I think there'll be other jobs that will come up and yep. uh, better, you know, better quality jobs and, you know, all that stuff. Um, let's see. Uh, so did you, I, I'm just, you know, th- th- there is that emotional element, though, you know. You yeah, know, so I'm going to talk about the emotional element and I'm going to, I'm going to talk about the fear and 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 kind yeah. of the, the, the what this is going to cause in a culture and how how one should prepare mm-hmm. both as an individual and how one should be preparing people as a political oh, intellectual yeah. leader for the change. So yeah, I'll get to I that. just want to mention this though. In the Mark Cuban interview, he he mentioned he he said that the, the job of the future will be for those who uh, have like a liberal arts education, uh, you know, philosophy majors. English majors. I was a little bit surprised by that. I think Mark Cuban is trying to be a, a central planner again. I mean, uh, I, there's a certain element of truth there, and I'll get to that. But uh, I think we also have to realize that the right answer to what are the jobs of the future is, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Uh, nobody 100 right, years yeah. ago could imagine the jobs that we exist today. Nobody. Nobody even 50 years ago could imagine many of the jobs that exist today, certainly not 200 years ago. And I think that the right answer mm-hmm. to the question of what are going to be the jobs of the future is I don't know. Uh, now, mm-hmm. it, it is true that and, and by the way, if if um, if philosophy and the humanities stay at the kind of low quality they have today, then I'm not sure those degrees are going to be that valuable. So, yes, I can imagine some kind of philosophy degrees and some kind of humanities degrees would be valuable. But, it, but I think they would have to have a lot better components of, of actually providing guidance in terms of living and actually gu- providing guidance in terms of thinking. And, and those thinking skills are going to be incredibly valuable. But, it's, <laughs> but that's right. always true. It's just going to be accelerated. Oh, wait. Thanks. Appreciate the call. I'm going to take one more call, and then uh, we're going to go and discuss kind of the, the macroeconomic issues. Hi, you're on the Yuan Book Show. Who's this? Good afternoon, Mr. Brooke. I'm enjoying your show, and I'm a longtime fan of Van Rand, despite being a robot myself. <laughs> Excellent. I love hearing from robots. Go ahead. This is great. <laughs> Did you have a question? I guess the robot has no questions because it knows I everything. Wanted to ask- yeah, go ahead. Why would a robot. I'm just doing my best. I hear all this talk about taxing me. I do all the work and you humans just <laughs> sit around. So is that fair? Um... <laughs> all right. Great. I don't know who that was, but that was that was the coolest call I've ever got. All right. So the robots are complaining because they're going to be taxed. Yeah, I wonder if that's Jonathan. I don't know. I, I should memorize. I should memorize his phone number. It, 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 Jonathan, was that you? Uh, he could tell us on the chat, but uh, 
but somebody with a good sense of humor. Uh, that was great. So, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, robots are being, uh, robots, you know, Bill Gates is proposing the robots be taxed. We talked about this a little bit on a previous show, but, uh, you know, there's more to be said about the whole idea of taxing robots. So let's, uh, so let's jump into, into this topic. I want to do a little bit of history about automation, 19th century, and where we are today. Uh, and then I want to talk about a little bit about kind of where we are in the robotics revolution and where we're likely to be heading in terms of robotics. And then I, I want to talk about taxing robots today and what impact that would have and whether that makes sense. And what, is, what does it even mean to tax robots? Uh, robots don't make, you know, they make anything, right? And, um, and then uh, I, want to, I want to talk about, um, you know, what, what is it? Why are we confident the jobs will be created? Because this, this is a big one. I mean, so it's always happened in the past, but we hear over and over and over and over again that this time is different. What, why are we confident, or why are some of us confident that this time it's, it's, it's not different, that it's the same? What is it about human nature? What is it about uh, any, the economics of a free market, even a semi-free market that we have today, that assures us that uh, this time it's not different, that it's the same? And indeed, could it be different? That is, uh, could, uh, could changes in, in the kind of, uh, for example, could government interference make it different this time? Right. So, so a lot to cover. But I, but I just I, so I want to mention a few facts about the past just to give it context. So 200 years ago, over 70 percent of America's workers lived on farms. Right. Today, less than one percent of them live on farms. And that's because of automation. That's because of tractors. And, and uh, you know, I don't know. I don't even know what farm automation looks like. But it's all the stuff that that farming does. Uh, many of the one percent who who do have jobs on farms, um, a lot of that is is specialty farms like organic farmings and things like that. So actual mass production of food is done incredibly efficient by machines with very very little uh, human intervention. Um, you, you know, there's still certain things that are picked by hand. I don't know strawberries and certain fruits, but that's going to become automated uh, without a question. Over the next uh, over the next uh, few years, um, you know, seventy so seventy percent of the of the jobs that exist today did not exist two hundred years ago, and and were not even imagined uh, two hundred years ago. And as I said, a, a lot of jobs that today exist weren't imagined fifty years ago. I mean, how many people fifty years ago believed there would be such a profession as um, computer game programmer? or computer game, whatever, right? I don't know even what they do in computer games. A writer, simulator, a creator, and so on. Computer gaming employs thousands, if not tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people all over the world. Uh, and, and it also provides, at the other hand, entertainment for, for hundreds of thousands, for, sorry, for tens of millions of people all over the world. And, you know, that, that uh, nobody could have imagined that just, uh, just maybe 40, 50, 60 years ago. Um, and, and that's, and it, so not to mention, you know, all the millions of other jobs. Now, I've talked a lot about on this show and other places about the fact that 100 years ago, there was no, on, on any scale, there was no hospitality uh, industry. There was no real, you know, hospitality industry. And, um, Yet today, millions of people work in the hospitality industry. And here I'm talking about hotels, resorts, uh, restaurants. You know, and then you could even increase. And then there's a, there's a luxury good industry. There's a, I mean, everywhere you go, there are massage parlors. I mean, I mean the legit ones, right? Uh, the illegit ones, I think they always existed. But they, the legit ones, uh, you've got uh, nail salons everywhere. I just walked by in a mall, what was it? Um, eyebrow threading store. I don't even know what that is, and I don't think I want to know what that is, right? But all this stuff that nobody could have imagined, and possibly maybe people did imagine, but nobody had the wealth to consume. No, nobody could go on vacation 100, 150, certainly 200 years ago, because nobody had the wealth to go on vacation. Everybody was working. I mean, one of the things we, we don't realize is how little we work today. 
relative to our ancestors in terms of just sheer numbers of hours in a year, we probably work less. And the people who work the most today are the people whose profession, the people who enjoy their work the most. So I, I think that there are a lot of people in business who really enjoy their work or people in entertainment who enjoy their work are the people who work the longest hours. So we have a situation today where, where the boring stuff, we're working the least, least numbers of hours. The, the interesting stuff, the stuff that we really enjoy, are, uh, are the, uh, we work the largest numbers of hours, and we generally have huge amounts of time for leisure activities, for going to the movies, for going to, uh, to restaurants. I mean, who could have imagined, even 20 years ago, that there would be celebrity chefs and that people like myself would travel around the world going to, you know, fancy restaurants just for the experience of eating new food in an interesting, fascinating way. I mean, foodies, right? Who could have imagined there would be such a thing? And that middle class people could participate in this, that it wouldn't be something exclusive to the 0.1 percent of, of the wealthiest, uh, you know, in the world. And you could go on and on and on and on with these ideas about, uh, about the kind of professions that both wealth today have created, the, the, the existence of the, the fact that we are wealthy, and that, uh, that the fact that, all, that much of our material needs, for example, food, has been uh, given over to robots so they can do it so we don't have to worry about it. Right? But think about you know, a, most of the material things that we today consume are to a large extent, to a large extent already being produced by robots, okay? So, but that has created a massive space, massive opportunities for us to do other things and to invent new things and to innovate other things and to figure out what do we want to do with our lives? Like, you couldn't, 200, 200 years ago, 99% of people in the world couldn't sit around saying, what do I want to do with my life? What would be fun to do? You know, what, what does it mean to be human? What's the human experience? How do I apply myself to maximize my own happiness? None of those questions could have been asked 200 years ago. There wasn't time. And, and you didn't have any options. And you had, to, you had to work really, really hard 10 hours a day just to feed yourself and, and house yourself and just, just to survive. Suddenly, we're wealthy enough to have, actually have thoughts that maybe we haven't had since ancient Greece or, or, or you know, and some people had during enlightenment, but now everybody can have them. And that, that's what's unique. Even in ancient Greece, it was only the exclusive realm of a few people to be able to actually have the time to, to think about these thoughts. Plus, our life is so much more comfortable than it was back then. Right. By the way, um, you should be live tweeting this, right? Uh, and thank you to Penny for actually doing that. But uh, you guys should be live tweeting to expand the audience because the, the bigger the audience, the more we can have an impact on the world and the better it is for all of you selfishly. You should be sharing the show. You should be sharing it on Facebook right now. If you're listening right now on Facebook Live, press the share button, get it out there. Uh, if you're listening on Blog Talk Radio, then uh, go to Facebook and like it and tweet it and do whatever it is. You do it, put it on, on I don't know. I, I don't know where you put it on anymore, but whatever the latest, coolest uh, uh, social media, get the word out there. So And use hashtag you on book show um, when you tweet. So uh, so people out there, you know, let's, let's have the wrong book show trending instead of, Video game movie mashup. That's what's trending right now. And UFC London. I guess those are much more important things culturally than, uh, than this show. All right. So if you, go back, um, if you go back to the 19th century, what you find is that the same kind of debates, the same kind of analysis, the same kind of concern about automation that we're seeing today with robots, there was very little difference. You know, um, you know, people, people looked at mechanization, right? All these machines taking off human jobs. And, and we're talking about B 
big time, you know, millions and millions of jobs being taken over machines. Now, there weren't that many people on the planet. One of the great advantages of mechanization is you can now feed, clothe, house billions of people. Whereas, you know, in the 19th century, uh, how many people were there? They, you know, it was like like half a billion, I think, um, people. I just saw a graph. I just I just tweeted a graph that had that. Let me just find this so I can tell you what the numbers were. But uh, yeah, there it is. Okay, so if you look at around 1800, there were, in terms of population, there were, you know, about a billion people on the planet. Today, there were over, over 7 billion, I think. Right. So from a billion, so we're seven times more people. Uh, GDP per capita has gone up by uh, 12 fold, something like that, 12 fold. So we're much, much richer. And there are many, many, many more people around. And that's to a large extent the consequence of automation, of, of the fact that we have freed ourselves from the necessity to produce the things that are necessary for our very uh, existence. Now I'm going to get, I'm going to get to the question which people in the chat uh, are getting at. You know, can robots become conscious? Do they have rights? Is singularity going to happen in the sense that not just robots can do things, um, certain cognitive skills better than better than humans, but uh, for example, beat us at chess, uh, but uh, which they already can. But um, you know, can they replace human beings in everything? Of course, that's that's what I think uh, singularity suggests, and that's what many people suggest is the idea that they will replace us with anything. We'll get to that, um, but uh, I, I want to make sh- I want to I want to emphasize that the same debates, the same concerns, the same panic, all of these things um, were happening in the 19th century. Now. In a sense, there was a certain awe at the machines, right? Just like there was a certain awe at the at the computers, a certain awe at uh, at uh, robots. But then there was also real fear, riots, demonstrations, destructions of machines, um, you know, and 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 real fear about it. Of course, of course, uh, factory owners loved uh, machines. And by the way, one of the reasons. You got a a significant reduction in child labor. And one of the reasons that child labor basically disappeared during the 19th century was because they were replaced by machines. And, you know, as as one factory owner uh, wrote or said about workers, he says, uh, machines never get drunk. Their hands never shook uh, from excess. They have never absent from work. They didn't strike for wages. uh, And they were unflailing in their accuracy and regularity. I mean, yeah. All these, this is what replaced people because, you know, people can be flawed machines. If you, if you maintain them, if you program them well, they are basically uh, perfect. So, uh, you know, I, I, think, I think it's pretty amazing um, to see exactly the same debate going on today. You know, again, a certain awe for machines on the one hand, but a certain fear of them on the other hand. You know, the, what were the consequences during the 19th century? The consequences were a dramatic, a dramatic collapse in the cost of everything. So a dramatic reduction in costs, which made sta- which resulted in a dramatic increase in the standard of living. Uh, staple goods became cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. There was more leisure time for workers and less need for strenuous manual labor. And, and there's a really good article about this in capex.co. Capex is, I think, a, a, a UK think tank. Capex.co, why we should never listen to the Luddites. Very good article. It doesn't really answer the question of why we should never listen to the Luddites, but it tells a really good story about the 19th century and about, uh, and about what kind of what the consequences of industrialization in the 19th century were for, for the benefit of human life. And of course, the, the, the real consequences is everything you have around us today. It's, it's, it's life in America today. It's, it's how rich, how unbelievably rich even the poor in America are relative to anybody was 200 years ago. Right? And, uh, you know, by the middle of the 19th century, 
most industry became capital in intensive instead of labor intensive. So even by the middle of the 19th century, most manual labor was being replaced by automation. And of course, this only has accelerated uh, over time. Uh, you know, one of the differences, one of the interesting differences this, this article points out, which I think is, is, is maybe not a difference anymore. One of the big differences is that um, when, uh, when people looked at America and the UK, one of the differences was that the British laborers um, always resisted change, always resisted automation, always fought it. The Luddites were very popular in Britain. And one of the things that made America unique, one of the things that made America special was the fact that Americans embraced innovation and embraced change and, 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 and cheered on the trend towards automation. And, you know, relatively speaking, I'm sure there was resistance or some Luddites here, but it, relative to the UK, it was a small number. And, and this, this makes me sad, right, because that's not what you're seeing today. It's, it's what you're seeing uh, the opposite, right? Um, you know, people like Karl Marx uh, played off of this automation and played off of, of uh, what they claimed was uh, this was all going to create this um, uh, alienation. Where they, 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 they claimed that all this automation, but factory jobs as well, was going to create uh, this angst, this existential angst among people. And you see the same argument being uh, made today. So this is the, the spiritual crisis that capitalism was going to create because, you know, machines were going to take your jobs and you're going to feel alienated because what are you going to do now that the machine has taken your job and you as a human being were going to feel useless and helpless and ignorant and there's nothing you can do and it was going to destroy your self-esteem. And it's fascinating because I was reading this article in Atlantic Magazine. I guess it's an article that was written uh, when was this? In December, after Donald Trump was elected and analyzing kind of the, the, the frustration of the people who voted for Donald Trump. And it's exactly the same language. It's the it's this, uh, you know, American workers have no have no source of meaning. They are lo they're losing their jobs. They can't get self-esteem. Now, there's a complication here, which is that over the last few decades, we have demonized and, and made. Um, uh, what would you say, made it, uh, you know, unsexy and uncool to have a manual job. So everybody needs to be, you know, uh, uh, some kind of program or intellectual in order to deserve self-esteem from the work that they do. That's kind of the, the, the left is, I think, to a large extent responsible for that kind of attitude. They, they, they've, they've, you know, they, they look down on manual labor, they do down on people uh, struggling to make a living, even though they claim to be, you know, the left always claims to be uh, 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 the friend of the working class, they've actually become the enemy of the working class. That's part of what I think the Trump phenomena or the, the election of Trump represents. It represents the fact that um, many Democrats felt that the de many Democrats felt that the Democratic Party had betrayed them. Many Democrats felt that the Democratic Party had become elitist, had, be had become a party that, that didn't understand working people, didn't respect working people, didn't care about working people. And I think that's right. I think I think and this is the this is the whole um, attack on the elites, the attack on the elites, the elites uh, don't care about working class people who actually work for a living. And, and there's a whole there's an article in the Atlantic, the spiritual crisis of uh, modern economy, that deals with all this stuff, and you know about how how uh, alienated people are. They're losing their jobs. Machines are taking over, and what are they going to do? And and they can't think of what they could do. And they're unemployed, or they're underemployed, or they're partially employed, and they're just frustrated by the world and its machines and its Chinese. And they and they, they, they no jobs in their little community, and they can't think of what else they could do, or they just don't think. And this is the big spiritual crisis. And as I was reading this, and I was thinking, oh my God, this is exactly what Marx says in the mid nineteenth century. This is exactly what kind of the existentialist said in the middle of the twentieth century. This is the same, same, same old story of capitalism creating alienation and creating people you know, destroying self esteem and the spirituality and all this garbage. And, and yeah, it's all true if you refuse to be a human being, if you if refuse to embrace what it means to be human, if you, replete, if you refuse to do 
what is necessary for a human being in order to survive. And, and um, I think we, we live in a world where it seems like what people think is necessary for a human being to survive is to complain, to bitch, and to demand entitlement. And it used to be so then people understood that what was necessary to survive was to use their mind, to use their reason, to think, to innovate, to, to be entrepreneurial at whatever level you can do it, at whatever level you can imagine. But not to sit around and bitch and complain and moan and demand and, and have your hand out, but actually actually get off your butt and go out there and, and, uh, and find a job and, uh, and gain a skill and move to another place in the country where that skill is, is – uh, is valued and, and where you would get paid for it. There's a, you know, we have now instituted into our American psyche, and I find it hard to believe that I'm saying this about America, into our American psyche, an intellectual laziness, an entitlement, a, a demand not to have to move anywhere, not to have to retrain at all, not to have to rethink what we do in our life, and to have the same job for 50 years and be able to retire on, on nice benefits and live well forever. And this is why there's such an appeal for this universal basic income because the idea with the universal basic income is we'll guarantee you an income. So if you don't want to be ambitious, if you don't want to retrain, if you don't want to reskill, we are not going to penalize you. We're not going to penalize you for all that. You're still going to get a basic universal income. You're still going to get enough money to live well off of. And, and where does that money come from? Well, it comes from those who are ambitious, those who are innovative, those who are going to create and build something. We're going to take money from them and provide it for you because our expectations of you have now come down to the point where we don't expect you to be able to find another job. We don't expect you to be able to, to, to retrain yourself. We don't expect you to be able to entrepreneur. We don't, to be an entrepreneur. We don't expect you to innovate, to, to do anything, uh, to figure out what people want or, or, or to figure out something they don't know that they want and provide it to them. Lack of imagination, but, but also lack of expectation from human beings. The assumption is you're all lazy and stupid, right? All right. Okay, all right. So, you know, so this is not an all, uh, none of this, none of this is, is new. Not the threat of the robotics taking people's jobs, not people's response to it. Uh, not the intellectuals' response. To it. If you go back to the intellectuals back then, um, you know, even even some of the industrialists themselves who who were panicking and were worried about uh, about what they were doing, and, and just like today, you've got the Elon Musk's of the world and other entrepreneurs of Silicon Valley advocating strongly for universal basic income because they're convinced that they are destroying jobs for people and uh, that what they are doing. What they're doing, well, you know, is is uh, is bad for people somehow, and that they need to adopt the universal income, because otherwise people will really not have jobs. So, it really is uh, nothing new under the sun when it comes to the robotics uh, discussion, to the robotics debate. It, it's the same arguments that have always been made. And, uh, you know, I strongly believe that those arguments are going to fail again. And, and, and why are they going to fail? They're going to fail because there's no limit to human needs and human wants. You know, there's no limit to human imagination. There's no limit to the kind of things we can do with our minds. There's no limit to the kind of places we can go. You know, imagine the day where we have an entire tourism industry built on going into space. Uh, and, and there could be thousands and thousands of people employed in such an industry. Um, there's no limit to progress. There's no limit to wealth. There's no limit to, to what can be produced and created. Now, the only limit that there is is my imagination. I can't imagine all the wonderful things that are going to happen. Because, I, you know, I'm, I don't have a good enough imagination for it. But it's just a limit of, of the human mind, of, of the limit of, of imagination. Now, there, there could be a limit, and that limit could be just if we impose by force, if we restrict people's imagination, if we restrict people's use of their own reason, if we restrict people's ability to think, then yes, then, then we're going to get a, a sliding back into adult ages. But 
as long as people are allowed to think, as long as people are left alone to think, and as long as people can create, can imagine, can produce, then there will be new jobs, there will be new things that we, we desire. I mean, I saw this article, this article in, um, in Wired magazine from 2012 that, that is, there was really an interesting analysis and he did a good job. And he divided up all the existing jobs and new jobs into four quadrants. So quadrant A is jobs today that humans do, but machines will eventually do better. And you can think of thousands of jobs that machines could one day, relatively soon, do better than what we're doing today. I mean, you will get machines driving trucks. You will get, you know, machines um, flying airplanes. I mean, even today, the 787 does not need a pilot. And indeed, it's not clear why we need a pilot in the cockpit of a 787 at all. Because the autopilot is just as good, just as reliable, probably much more reliable than any pilot would be. Right? A lot of tax preparation today is, is done by computers and x-ray analysis. X-ray analysis is done by computers. And indeed, CAT scans can be done by computers better than by human eye because they can, they can see finer, the finer details within an x-ray, within a CAT scan than a human eye can see, right? So, so you know, jobs today the human do, but they're going to they're gonna disappear. And they're going to be a lot of them, a lot of them. Some programming, low-end programming jobs. Any job that can be repetitive, any jobs that can put into a, a relatively easy into an algorithm, and, and some of these algorithms are, in a sense, quote, self-learning. They, they develop, they learn in, in some way from the data that you keep feeding them. Um, so many of today's tasks are going to be replaced by that, right? But then there are all kinds of jobs that we as human beings cannot do, right, that machines are going to do, right, that robots can do, uh, very, very fine, very, very like nanotechnology type things. Like, you know, you couldn't build a, um, a computer chip without automation. Well, imagine the kind of computer chips we can build with robots. And as robots become better, because already most computer chips are built by, all computer chips are built by robots. But imagine as they become better and more accurate and more and more, right? Um, you know, there are going to be so many things that we, that engineers today say, I wish I could do that, that once robots become better and more sophisticated and finer, they will be able to do. Uh, you know, the, the AI, you know, what's called artificial intelligence, their ability, the ability to analyze these vast quantities of data, the ability to, 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 to uh, you know, to map the human genome, the ability to to uh, simulate different things around the human genome and understand what it, all these genes actually do. Uh, you know, once we get big data, and it, well, we have big data, once we improve the tools to analyze them. Um, so the ability to do more things, so one, robots are gonna take our jobs. Two, robots are gonna do jobs that we can't even imagine today. Robots are gonna do them, not us, right? Now, that is probably gonna require new jobs on our behalf, right? So, uh, you know, there are, certain, there are certain tumors that are removed today by robots. You know, robots drive carts on Mars. Uh, they put in, uh, fa uh, patterns on fabrics uh, automatically that, you know, that you can download from the Internet and send to a robot, right? There are a million things that are being done today by robots that, it, that would dazzle anybody 100 years ago, 150 years ago, 200 years ago, certainly even 50 years ago. Right. And, you know, all this exists. And machines are doing them. I mean, think about, in a sense, the, the, the mechanization of every aspect, every aspect uh, of our of our human life. So then then we have jobs that robots uh, you know, robot jobs that we can't even imagine yet. Lots of jobs that robots are going to do that we can't imagine. So we can imagine them driving trucks. But we can't imagine the kind of professions, the kind of things that robots will do as we get smarter, as the robots get better and faster and more agile and more complex. So, so the 
millions of jobs out there that are going to be robot jobs, right? And then all those robot jobs, or a lot of those robot jobs, are going to require some human interference, right? So, so this article predicts that the highest earning professions in the year 2050, 2050 will depend on automations and machines that have not been invented yet. Right? We can't yet see the machines and technologies that will make these jobs possible. Robots create jobs that we did not even know we wanted done. So robots create massive jobs in and of themselves. And then the last type of jobs it is, is jobs that only humans will be able to do, at least for a while. You know, and, and, and it's, you know, a lot of that is human interaction type jobs. A lot of that is, um, is intelligent type jobs, is, is jobs that relate to choices, it jobs that require free will, it jobs that require the cognitive skills that human beings have, uh, jobs that require design and an artistic flair. I mean, robots might be able to mimic certain artistic things, but, but suddenly, because of industrialization, we now have time to go become ballerinas and become athletes and fashion designers and yoga masters and fan fiction authors and all kinds of other things. I mean, my two sons, one writes comedy and one is in the music business. Now, neither one of those jobs are likely to be taken over by robots, maybe ever. Certainly not any time in the near future, but I think ever, because they require certain cognitive skills and they require, uh, I, I think, free will in a, in, in a way that robots will never be able to mimic. Not really. So, you know, you can easily say that the number of entertainers is going to grow dramatically because the number of entertainers in the world has grown exponentially over the last hundred years. Who had time to be an entertainer? Who had the wealth to pay an entertainer? But yet today, just by downloading from iTunes, doesn't cost us much, but we are, we've created a whole industry of entertainers and that industry is only going to grow. And the amount of leisure time we have in order to enjoy this entertainment is only going to grow. So suddenly we have the opportunity. You know, this article says that we'll then be empowered to dream up yet more answers to the question, what should we do? It will be many generations before a robot can answer that. Now, I'm not sure it can ever be answered, but certainly... You know, we're safe for a few generations without any question, right? And, it, you know, those are the kind of interesting professions that are going to exist in the future, the kind of interesting professions that say, that uh, that about what should we do? What kind of things would enhance human life? What kind of things would make human life more enjoyable, more fulfilling, um, more exciting, more thrilling? What kind of professions is that? Those are the kind of professions, so instead of, Truck drivers, they won't be any truck drivers. Now, that means people will have to reorient the way they think about work. It means our educational system is going to have to shift dramatically. It means that a truck driver's kids are going to have to be educated in a different way than the truck driver was. And, and this is where Mark Cuban, in a sense, is right, right. Because long term, and I don't know how long this is going to take, the kind of professions where the main question is, what should we do? What should we do? That are should type questions are more kind of liberal arts questions, are more human flourishing type questions that need answering. And, and that might require more psychologists, more artists, more philosophers than it requires, you know, simple engineers. It might require certain types of engineers. So we're going to see and see more and more and more professions that engaged in human flourishing rather than prof professions that engage in human survival. So almost everything that is required for basic survival is already automated and is going to become completely automated by robots, including any manual labor that is required for human comfort. So put aside flourishing, comfort, like doing the dishes and, and, and washing our clothes, which is already far superior to what it was 
not that long ago, but he's going to become much, much better. So human survival and human convenience are all going to be taken care of by robots. And then what's left is the flourishing. It's the art. It's the what should I do. It's how should I live. It's the computer games, right? It's the movie industry. It's music. It's art forms we can't even imagine today. Three-dimensional, you know, live action in your living. I don't know. What do I know, right? I do not, specifically do not have the kind of imagination uh, to, to, to imagine what that would all look like. But that's what it's about. All right. All right. We're going to take one more call. And then I want to get back to, I want to get to the question of what does this imply for you? What does this imply for everybody? What kind of life decisions one must make today because we are at an inflection point. We are approaching a, a big dislocation in terms of work. What does that mean for you? All right. Hi, you're on the Iran Book Show. Who's this? Hi, Iran. This is Debbie. Hey, Debbie. How's it going? Oh, very well. Thank you. Um, you know, well, first of all, I'm really glad to hear you saying very emphatically that no one can predict what's going to happen in, in terms of future technology, because yep. that's just so true. And it's not just people who don't. I mean, it's even really, really creative people in technology. I, I read an interesting prediction made by Thomas Edison back in 1911 yeah. for what kinds of things people would have in 2011. And um, it, it was pretty comical. <laughs> Yeah. Like his way of thinking was so very focused on um, it was very analog. Um, yep. So one thing that he talked about was that books, he says, books of uh, of the coming century will all be printed leaves of nickel, so light to hold that the reader can enjoy a small library in yeah. a single volume. But that's see, really cool. So he's right? basically envisioned, yeah, yeah, like an analog version <laughs> of an iPod, but but like just so unsophisticated compared to what we actually have. Even well, he couldn't his, imagine his, his a digital world. I mean, the, oh, right. I, and this is the guy exactly. who kind of figured out electricity and what we could do with it, right? And and he, it, he so he was already dealing world. with bits in a sense, but didn't realize that he was dealing in bits and didn't realize what the potential of that was. So the very inventor who made the digital world possible, or at least who contributed significantly to it, could not envision that same world. Yeah, but let's so, um, just to. Yeah, I, I mean, I was okay, going to no, give a, a current example of that, and that's the whole venture <laughs> capital community, right? I mean, even the best venture capitalists in the world, um, ba basically, are making bets on technologies that are going to have an impact in five, ten years, not in the very distant future, and even there they get it wrong more often than they get it right. And we're talking about the smartest, most educated, most you know, aware of technology people on the planet. And they, get, yeah. and they make more mistakes. You know, they have more failures than they have, than they have winners. Now, um, so if you take Sequoia, Kleiner, Pokins, they probably, uh, half of their companies fail. Another few of them succeed, but succeed you know, just a little bit. Then, then maybe 20% of their companies succeed really well, and then one or two of the companies are home runs in, in, for any given five to 10 year period. So, even the best minds today who are thinking about this constantly can't even predict the next five to 10 years with accuracy, never mind what the world is going to look like in 30 to 40 years. Yeah, absolutely. I don't even know if the, if the percentages are as good. As you say, well, I was it using be the best. Worse, I was using the best. best venture capitalist in the world, right? Not not the average. Yeah. The average venture capitalist is much worse than that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, so it's it's a point really well worth reinforcing um, that 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 the unpredictability, which I find delightful, yeah. <laughs> of, yeah. of what's coming next. Yeah. Um, but the the thing that I had actually called um, about originally was the the issue of education, which I see as a very important part yeah. of this issue, and why people are so freaked out by the prospect of having to have more sophisticated, more thought intensive, critical thought intensive jobs. And I'm just never cease to be shocked by the lack of ability to do basic critical thinking, um, and, and I attribute that to our education, our government education system. It's almost like government-induced brain damage on a massive scale. And that is the part of this that worries me the most. And um, so... And I agree uh, I with you completely. So, 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 yeah. So the biggest downside here 
And thanks for calling. Really appreciate it. It's good to hear from somebody from Silicon Valley. But it, you know, the the biggest the biggest challenge here it really is education, and and, and the fact that education is controlled by government, uh, and the fact that education uh, has basically eliminated uh, or, or, or actually stamps out, particularly the in the worst cases, critical thinking skills. And it's the critical thinking skills, it's the ability to think that is going to be so crucial in the future. And I'm not talking about the ability to do math or the ability to think in terms of, you know, people say, oh, we need to get everybody to program and we need, and this is the push, right? It's the push to get kids into to program. But it's not about that. It's not about any particular skill. The fundamental skill that is going to be more required in the future than ever in the past, but was always required for a good human life, always, right? Is the ability to think critically, is the ability to use your mind. It's the ability to, to, to use the mind, even in the sense that you have to have a really sharp mind in order to write comedy, in order to be an entertainer, in order to produce, in order to answer the question, what should we do? What is good for human life? What are the kind of products and kind of things that, we sh that, that, that should be produced in order to enhance human flourishing? That should requires real activation of the human mind. It requires actual thinking. It requires engagement with the world. It requires an active, engaged mind. It's not about, and again, what, what most people today think in terms of, oh, we need to teach kids to think, is that they want to teach them a skill, programming. Now, I'm all for teaching kids programming, because I think programming teaches a certain aspect, a certain way of thinking. It teaches logic, is, is I think the primary thing it teaches, and it teaches something about the way the electronics work and, and the way the world works, so, so that's, that's a good thing. But that's not the essential. The essential is kind of what Montessori education does, which is teach very young kids how to engage with the world, how to induce information from the world, induce knowledge from the world, how to integrate knowledge across and how to apply that skill in a creative way, not in a mechanized, automated way, but in a creative way. And, and one of the challenges is to take that and apply that kind of education, that kind of methodology, the methodology of sustained critical thinking, and, and, and at the same time provide the students with knowledge of the world around them. How do we do that, you know, throughout school and how do we replace public education with private education so that real innovation real competition real thinking can be applied to the field of education because right now within the world of government schools there is no innovation going on and there is no thinking going on it, it, you know there's there's some pseudo thinking going on at universities which produces awful products which are then crammed down students throats at the schools which destroy critical thinking you know in the old days, it was new math or site C or whatever it is, and I'm sure it has the, the new variations today. I'm not up to speed on the latest monstrosities coming out of the uh, colleges of education, but, but I can guarantee that none of them are very good. Well, the monstrosities, they can't be good. But there's nothing very good coming out of those, uh, uh, those colleges which would actually enhance um, education. So, you know, the number one political, in my view, the number one political issue that is more important than any other issue for human flourishing in the future, for, for human success in the future, for, for, for dealing with the disruption that is going to happen with the coming of robots and the automation of our entire economy, is education, education, education. And, and what I mean by education is mean privatize it, get the government out of it. And, and I think the way to achieve that is to retain government funding of education, but get the government out of running education. They shouldn't manage school. They shouldn't control schools. They shouldn't, and they shouldn't even decide how parents use the funding in terms of which school to go, uh, which school to go to. So I like, and I've talked about this on a previous show, education saving accounts. And if, if there was one political, I mean, put aside Obamacare, put aside all this other stuff that's going on, Trump, if there was one political issue that I think is the most political, the most important political issue to rally around, the most important political issue to write your congressman about, the most pol important political issue to, to advocate for, it's privatizing education. And I think the more private, the better, anyway, from charter school to vouchers to tax credits to what I think is the best, which is education saving accounts. Any one of those is an improvement, but education saving accounts is the ultimate improvement. 
and we should be advocating for that and let the conservatives worry about the, the other ones. Um, because it is about future, is about thinking, and it's about thinking skills, but not just thinking skills as applied to your profession, but in the future, and I think this applies right now. I mean, it's already known, I think, among young people that you're going to have to change professions over your career. You're not going to have one career. You're going to have multiple careers. You're going to shift. You're going to change. You're going to have to learn new skills. You're going to have to be agile. And that kind of ability, that kind of ability to constantly to, to think on your feet, to, be, to have the self-esteem, because this is not just about thinking. It's also about self-esteem. To have the self-esteem, to be willing to, to, to jump from one career to another career, from one company to another company. I mean, I know a lot of businessmen who are older, who, who look down on, on people who job jump, who, 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 have done, who have a resume with lots of jobs on it. And I think they're missing the boat. I think this job jumping is exactly the kind of skill that we're going to need in the future because things are going to move so fast. You're going to have to be willing and able to switch jobs, switch careers, switch focus, learn new things, learn to do stuff. And that's going to require a whole mental focus on that, on what am I doing today? Is this the best that I'm doing with my life today? Uh, is my job under threat from a robot? Is my job under threat from AI or from something? Um, how do I adjust? How do I change? Uh, you know, even if I do that, I, I still need to be aware of my new job that even though robots haven't competed that job away, it could be competed 10 years later. I need to make sure that I'm always reading, that I'm always looking, that I'm always educating myself, that I'm aware, that I'm alert. So Korea can't be, okay, I've chosen to be a doctor. Here's the one path that exists. And now, I don't think doctors ever had that because there was always new technology, new medication, new treatments. They had to be aware of all that. But there also has to be aware now another element. There's technology that can affect my job. It can take my job away. It can do some of what I do better, like surgery. Um, I need to be conscious, conscious constantly of the technology, of the latest technologies, how, not just how it affects how I do my job, but the very existence of my job. And how do I design my job as I move forward to make sure that I always have a job? That's what career means. When, when, when um, Ayn Rand talks about purpose and career as, as, as a cardinal value, purpose as being a cardinal value and career being most people's purpose, and when she talks about the virtue of productiveness, she's not talking about just doing work, going to a job, making a living. None of those concepts, purpose, career, productiveness, relate to just making a living and having a job. It's about consciously thinking about what you're doing, doing the best that you can at what you're doing, but also planning over the long term what you want to do and what you can do and what you should do. And, 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 and part of that is realizing the risks to your job coming from China or coming from robots or coming from... And this is what pisses me off royally about people who pander to, we've lost the jobs to China, China has taken our jobs, not to put aside the collectivism implied by that. But much more important than that is the, is the issue of um, personal responsibility. I mean, personal responsibility in the deep objectivist sense, not in the conservative sense. In the deep objectivist sense, which means taking responsibility over your own life, figuring out what you want to do with your life, figuring out what is going to be necessary for you to do in your life, figuring out what the threats and what the opportunities are in your life, in the scope, in the realm of what is possible to you, given your abilities, given your intelligence, given your skills. Now, this is a point that, that uh, uh, I was at a seminar uh, last week and, and Greg Solomiri made, but I've made before as well in, in one version or another, but Greg really made it in an appointed way. And, and like you, you're in South Ohio and you just lost your job because I don't care because of what, because of AI, because of robots, because of China. Get off your butt and go find a new job. And by the way, five years before your job, you lost your job. Could you predict, could have you? <laughs> okay, let me start over. Could you have predicted that you would lose the job? Could you have done something to prevent you from losing your job? Or could you have been prepared for the day when you lost your job to be able to shift a new job that was safer and better for you? 
did you go to night school to get new skills and to, or to perfect the skills that you have so you wouldn't lose that job or, or, or not lose that job. Maybe that job was doomed, but so that you would have another job. That's what it means to take your life seriously. That's what it means. That's what Americans always did. I, there was always a percentage that bitch and complained. But the essential characteristic of Americans was that they took responsibility over the entirety of their life, that they, they planned ahead, that they thought about these things, and they, and they actually focused on it, and they, 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 they were responsible for themselves because they realized that your happiness is only dependent on you, on your thinking, on your willingness to think, on your ability to think. And, and the same with education. If we care about a kid's education, then don't send your kid to stupid public schools that are, that, that are dumbing them down. Find the best school possible. Fight politically for an alternative. Fight, fight, fight for the alternatives. Not just as, oh, yeah, I'm for school choice, but go and, and really make, do something of it instead of getting all consumed about Islam or getting all consumed about, um, about immigration or getting all consumed about trade or getting all consumed about Hillary versus Trump. It would be cool if objectivists and others got all consumed about the battle, the most important battle, the most fundamental battle for, for privatizing education, which is, which is so essential for our kids and our grandkids' ability to lead good lives. Without it, everything is doomed. Everything is lost. So, you know, this is, my, this is the mall point that robots bring up, right? The, the, the kind of economic almost metaphysical uh, human nature point is we always have more desires, more needs, more wants. Uh, there's always going to be another um, frontier that we want to explore, somewhere new we want to go, something new that's never been done before. There's always going to be breakthroughs. There's always going to be play things that, that, that need to be done. And, and a lot of those things are still going to require certain manual labor. And, and there's always going to be a percentage of the population that does manual labor. But the fact is, for example, you know, all the nail salons and the massage parlors and all this stuff that requires a human touch. Now, maybe one day they won't. Maybe one day you'll go and there'll be a machine that massages you and does it exactly the way a human being does it. And that's also possible. And one can imagine that over the next 100 years, manual labor, generally all manual skills will disappear. And that means that more and more and more human beings will be human beings. Because essentially what it means to be human is to use our minds. What it means to be human is to be a rational animal. And therefore, therefore that's great. That means more human beings will have the option of, 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 of using their minds in order to make a living. That, you know, that's really cool. Now, well, we, the, the, the only responsibility I would say we have socially right, is to get out of the way of the educational process to stop producing a crummy, brain-numbing product that is going to destroy the capacity of half of humanity to actually do those jobs. And that's the number one political issue of our time, not... At minimum guaranteed income, and it's not, um, it's not, you know, uh, uh, taxing robots, which is just taxing capital, which is just taxing progress, which is taxing technology, which is taxing human prosperity and human flourishing, right? Which is so stupid, it's hard to imagine. It's basically a tax on capital. That's all it is. Robots are capital, right? So what we need, if, if Bill Gates really cares about human beings, if Bill Gates is really concerned about job losses, if Bill Gates is really concerned about the jobs of the future, what he should be advocating for, what he should be spending his billions and billions and billions of dollars on is a massive campaign to privatize education. And, and Zuckerberg should stop giving, hundred. you know, he gave $100 million to the New Jersey public school system, which, which just went down, it was like flushing the money down the toilet. Instead of that, he should, be, should have been investing that $100 million in, in private education. So, you know, that's, that's whatever issues come out of robotics, the solution is private education. Now, again, economically, metaphysically, human needs are unlimited, and the human ability is unlimited. The human mind is unlimited. The moral issue is 
had a bug there in the air and I was waving my hand, right? The moral issue is, and this is where we default again, it's because we don't teach people this. And this is where philosophy departments default. This is where parents default. This is why educational system default. This is certainly where our culture defaults. In, in a sense, teaching people to take care of themselves. Not to take care of themselves in the sense of tying their shoelaces, but to take care of themselves in terms of using their minds to figure out how to flourish, using their minds to figure out what values they should pursue, to use their minds to figure out how they can live the best human life possible, the best life possible to them. And I don't care how intelligent you are. This is not an issue of, of horsepower in a sense of intelligence. This is an issue of focus. This is an issue of what you're using that intelligence for. And if we use that intelligence, any human being can work, will have work in a, a robot-driven society as long as he's willing to engage his mind, as long as he's doing whatever ability he has. Because there'll be plenty of jobs that will not require a lot of high level of intelligence, but will require a mind. They can choose. They can make decisions. So um, I think it's going to be fun. I'm, I'm, I'm really looking forward to the future. I worry only because of philosophy and because of education that we're not preparing people for the future. I, I highly uh, you know, uh, encourage people to go read uh, Johann Norberg's uh, book called Progress, uh, which is an excellent book. It's, uh, and uh, Johann Norberg is a, is a friend and, and it's certainly an ally, a philosophical ally in what we do. And uh, Johan is all about the progress we've made to date and the progress that is possible in the future. And he, he's an optimist, and I, I like that. I am overall an optimist. The only thing, the only thing I'm, um, um, okay, so there's a question here. Oh, I don't know who, it's not, it's not to me. Uh, so, well, here's a question. So would you say there's nothing wrong with being a janitor who is very good at sweeping and cleaning, very skilled, although he was not thought about how to do his job better in, de in a decade. No, if he hasn't thought about how to do his job better in a decade, I do think there's something wrong. If you're not engaged in the mind, in actively in the mind on a big chunk of your day, then you're not fully human, right? So you're not engaged in human activity, and therefore I don't think you can flourish, and I don't think you can completely uh, be happy. I think you have to, you have to, be happy. You, ha you have to use your mind in order to be happy. You have to engage in rational thought in order to be happy. Right? And, and that's true of any profession. And a lot of these professions, the nice thing is, a lot of the professions that don't require you to do that are going to go away. And what will replace them, even, even the simplest job in the world in 50 to 100 years will require, as a feature of it, the engagement of human reason. And, and that's exciting. That is really, really, really uh, exciting. And, uh, and, and I, think, I think that people are panicking about robots, are people who uh, underestimate human ability. It's people who uh, don't really understand human nature and, and don't really see man as the rational animal, who, who think of themselves, they're the elitists who think of themselves as superior. We can deal with robots. We'll always, always have jobs. We have imagination, but, but most people don't. It's the superiority that so many central planners have. And, I, and I've said before, unfortunately, there is a central planning mentality in Silicon Valley. There's a central planning mentality, elitist central planning mentality in Silicon Valley. And this is why, you know, people could sit there and say we need a guaranteed minimum income because people are too stupid to take care of themselves. We know, we know how smart people are. and We know what they're going to have to be doing uh, in the future. So... I, I reject all that, but I do, again, the philosophical issue is how do we teach, how do we ingrain, how do we demand, morally demand, that people take on the responsibility for their own life, take on the responsibility for shaping their life, take on the responsibility of figuring out whether there's a future in their career or not, whether their job is going to be taken away or not, and figure out what path they should be on in the future. If you're a truck driver, your job is going to believe me. Let me give you an example. Let me give you an example. So um, 
I have a, a driver here in Orange County who often takes me like to LAX because I travel so much. And I use the same driver because I like him a lot. And, and this, is, this is a guy who used to work for a company I used. And he, he was the best driver there. So, so I kind of uh, um, I committed to him. And I, and I only used him. And I always asked the company for him. And then he, he said he was going to spin off and start his own company. And I said, well, I'm, I'm with you. I'm, I'm going to bring my business with you. And I'm going to recommend you to my friends. And, and I've got him a lot of business over the years and, and so on. And, and, you know, but he's, he, he's got one car. And uh, he's thinking about expanding to two cars. But we've had this conversation. And he's told me because he, he's thinking, right? And I like him because he's a thinker. He's a, he's a limo driver, but he's a thinker, right? And what does he say? He said, look, I, I'm looking at Uber and, and I'm looking at self-driving cars. And I know that in 10 years, I'm going to be competed out of business or, or, or there are going to be very few of us around. And so I, I, I'm going to buy a second car because this business requires me to have two cars. And if I'm going to make a living even the next two years, I need a second car. But you know what? Any money that I make here, I'm going to start looking for a new business because I'm going to be out of a business at some point, five years, 10 years, 20 years. But at some point, this business is not viable. It's not viable. Now, that's the kind of mentality everybody has to have in whatever your profession. Um, you know, if you're a radiologist, much of what you do is you're not going to be able to do in, in, in five years. AI software is going to take over. It's going to be able to look at those scans much better than you can. Now, there'll still be a need for some radiologists. But what kind of comparative advantage can you as a radiologist develop so that your job is safe and uh, so that your job, because mo most of the jobs are going to go away. You, you, there'll be fewer people doing a more intense skill, at a high intense skill level, a different skill level. And, and that's what's going to be, that new skills, whatever that is, is going to be value. So, uh, so I guess what I'm saying is you, you've got to be completely aware, completely alert, completely focused on what your career implies, what your career needs, what the future is going to be in place. You're still going to miss stuff because we, we can't predict the future with certainty. Um, I, I would definitely uh, keep, uh, you've got to look at technology because in any field, in any area you're in, technology will have an impact on you. So, um, you know, whatever you're doing today, you got to take full responsibility, which means engage be aware of the world how it's impacting how it's impacting your job your life and so on and, and then you've got to be, have the courage to often change careers midstream to learn new skills to take time off to learn a new skill to to, to maybe completely reverse course because life is not static and and i think people unfortunately i think there was a per period and to some extent i hope we're not heading towards another one where the economy was stagnant, relatively stagnant. People had the same job for a long time. Um, standard of living went up, but not that much. Innovation was restrained. And people got used to that kind of mentality. And, and that, because of technology, ain't the future. You're going to have to be agile. You're going to be have to be flexible. And you're going to have to be using your mind. All right. So I, I, I was going to talk about sharing... Um, and, uh, and I don't have time. So I'm going to do that in the AIM 560 talk. I'm going to talk about what it means to share. Um, you know, I usually give in my talks this uh, example of the kids in the sandbox sharing uh, and the parent demanding that they share. So I'm going to talk about whether that's a good thing or a bad thing uh, and, um, and so on and what it all means and what is egoism, uh, how does egoism relate to all this stuff and how does egoism relate to being nice to people and being kind to me, charitable, and so on. And what, is that consistent with objectivism or not? So please listen. It'll be up on the Blog Talk site in a few days. You can listen live on AM560 Chicago on, uh, on some of the radio stations, uh, some of the radio stations online, um, on iHeartRadio, I think. It's iHeartRadio. And uh, I will also be broadcasting it uh, here live on Facebook Live. So Facebook Live. It'll be, on, uh, it'll be on here in an hour, in an hour and 10 minutes, basically. It starts five minutes after the hour. Uh, so in an hour and 10 minutes, I'll be talking about sharing. Uh, so 
just wrapping up, I don't see any new callers, so just wrapping up our conversation today, right? Robots are not a threat. Robots are massive, massive benefit and opportunity. Massive, they're going to increase the amount of wealth. They're going to increase the quality and standard of living to unimaginable heights. We cannot imagine how good life has the potential to be 100 years from now because of technology and robots and the human mind and its application. Now, one of the, one of the, uh, um, the you know, requirements for that is freedom because human reason can only function when it is free. So coercion, force, authority, government controls, government regulations, the more of those we have, the less innovation, the less wealthy we will be in that distant future. But if we just, if, we, if we're granted freedom, even, I hate to say this, the limited freedom we have today, you know, I see an incredibly rosy future uh, into, well, I shouldn't say the limited freedom today because the limited freedom today is not static. It's either getting worse or getting better. Uh, if it gets worse, then, then the future could be very bleak. What we, need to, what we need to try is to make it much, 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 much better. And uh, because if it gets much better, freedom, we get more freedom, in other words. The amount of wealth, the, the kind of life human beings could live, I, I don't know. It's just, it's, it's, it's just unimaginable. It is imaginable by science fiction writers. I mean, it's, it, it, it's, it's hard to tell what the technology of 100 years from now will be. It's hard to tell what human beings' lifespan will be. You know, we might be living to two, 300 years. You know, what about space travel? What about the kind of vacations you take? What about the, I don't know, the enhanced sex you might have? Who knows what's, what's happening? Because I think one of the things that we're going to have is, is chips implanted in us and, and uh, that enhance our, our mental abilities, our cognitive abilities, and our, and our physical abilities. So I think we'll have microscopic robot, robots maybe in our bodies or maybe chips in our bodies. Who knows? I, I don't know. I don't know. But it is... The future is amazing. I mean, the thing that pisses me off more than anything else is the fact that I'm getting old and I'm going to die one day, right? I want to see how amazing this future is going to be and how amazing the technology is going to be. So, you know, if, if you have the technology to download my consciousness into something so I can live forever, I'm cool with that. All right. Okay, well, thanks. Oh, a, a movie recommendation. I think somebody on the chat mentioned this. I'm watching the series called Humans. And um, it's, it's a BBC produced, I think, with, I can't remember who the affiliate is in the U.S., but it's a, it's a British-U.S. Uh, joint production. Um, you know, I, uh, I really, I, I really enjoy it. I think it raises a lot of interesting moral questions. Now, granted, it's based on a premise I don't believe in, and the premise is that you can, you, can, um, you know, bring to life a robot so that they have true emotions and they really are conscious. But imagine if you had all those robots in the world and some are conscious and some are not and what humans would do in order to stop, to, in order to control the ones who are not, who are conscious um, and, and the whole cognitive dissonance of having conscious robots and what that means and, and everything. And uh, it's, kind of, it's really fascinating. I mean, I'm enjoying it. It's, there's a certain element of silliness to it as there is in most shows, uh, because of some of the science is, is, is off and some of the human relationships are off. But I, I'm enjoying it. I think, it's, I think it's quite entertaining and raises some interesting issues that don't just relate to how we relate to robots, but how do we relate to those who are different from us. So it's called Humans. Um, it's on, I can't, uh, FX maybe? I think it's FX. And... Um, you know, I know Tom wants a flying car. I want a flying car, too. Believe me, I want a flying car more than you want. I want a flying uh, supersonic car because then I could get to London in, like, five hours instead of the, you know, the ridiculous time it takes me today or maybe four hours. I, I could fly to I, – I, imagine, imagine the quality of life improvement. We've got a call, but, you know, I can't take it because we, we basically oh, – well, let's take this quickly, but you have to be really quick. Hi, you're in the Iran book show. Hi, you're on. It's Alan. Um, you mentioned science fiction, and I've wondered if you could uh, speak briefly about how over the even centuries from Frankenstein to Metropolis to Terminator, robots have just been depicted as something to fear. Do you have any comment about that? Yeah, what would be the origin point. of that? Yeah, that's a good point. That's a whole discussion. 
because I think generally we, we, we enjoy to be scared. You see that in the, in the horror movies today. You see that in the, um, uh, you know, all the zombie movies that are being produced. We, we love to be afraid. We love to believe the end of the world is coming. There's something, some, something that appeals to at least a lot of human beings, if not all of human beings, by that. And I think Frankenstein and all those science fiction novels have always played into that, into that fear that is, seems to have always existed in, among human beings. And, and it would be interesting to delve into the origins of that fear uh, sometime. So, so a lot of science fiction writing was geared towards that. But there was also a more optimistic vision of human of, of, in science fiction. So I think you, you can find science fiction that kind of explores the whole range of kind of human uh, human desires and human emotions even. So, so they were definitely optimistic, like, like Jules Verne, who were much more optimistic about the future and, and, and uh, didn't have the kind of uh, Terminator Frankenstein vision. Or, or Robert Hanlein, who he had kind of a weird vision of at least human sexuality, but at least, um, at least had a very positive view, vision of, of mankind's progress in the universe and its, its success on the planets. Now, I'm not an expert on science fiction, and it would be interesting to, to, to have an expert on science fiction on the show sometime to talk about that. I don't read enough science fiction to tell, but my guess is that a lot of the science fiction is positive and, and optimistic about the future. Uh, take Star Trek. I mean, Star Trek uh, has always been, or even Star Wars, there's a certain sense in which you have to create conflict, so there's always a, a, a battle going on. But at the end of the day, the good guys win, and technology seems to advance, and, and you know, uh, uh, life seems to be better, or at least that's what they, that's what I think they're fighting for is a better life. But it, to the extent that the technology is advanced, they seem to be freer. So um, I, I, there's a whole issue there about science fiction, and but there's also a whole issue about why people enjoy so much to be afraid and to be scared. And 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 I think I think this is and this relates to global warming why we think the world's going to end because of global warming and why we thought it was going to end because of global cooling and why we thought it was going to end because of population bomb and why we going to thought we, it was going to end because of cancer and why we thought it was going to end because God was upset at us and why we thought it was going to end for a million other reasons for the last 100,000 years. Every few years, there's a new reason why we think the world is going to end. There's something, I don't know, in, in storytelling or in uh, uh, psychology or maybe a consequence of the philosophy that we're being taught that, that requires a world-ending scenario on the horizon to get us all excited and riled up about the future. So I don't know. Uh, I mean, it, that's a whole interesting topic, which I think the robots fits in. The, 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 the robots fit into this global warming overpopulation story. Oh, no, and, and the Luddites have said this all along. Oh, no, the world's going to end because the robots are going to take over. None of us will have any jobs, and indeed the robots are going to kill us all because they're not going to need us anymore. This goes back to 2001 Space Odyssey, where the, where, where the computer doesn't need human beings anymore, so it starts killing them off. And there had been tons of science fiction stories about the computers trying to kill us all off because they don't need us, of which Terminator is maybe the, the, one of the best made and one of the most well-known. And I could do a whole show on, on, uh, on Terminator 1 and 2. Not 3 or any of the others, but 1 and 2 are brilliant. Um, anyway... There's something in the, it's something that that prevents us from being optimistic about the future. At least a significant portion of the population, and I think it's a rotten philosophy, and I think it's a rotten philosophy. It's a mysticism, a disrespect for reason, and altruism that drive this, and it's been around for a long, long, long time. Because all three of those have been around for a long, long time, really going back to when we lived in the caves or before. All right. I have to wrap up now because I have to prepare for the uh, AM560 show. So we are going to close. And uh, thank you. You've been listening to your own book show. Please, please go out there and share and like and do whatever it is that you do to let the world know. I think this was a pretty good show. I think people learned something from it. Also, also, don't forget to make a contribution to the Ayn Rand Institute. You're getting a value here. You shouldn't be free writing off of that value of other people supporting the Institute to, to, to pay me to do this. So you go to the Ayn Rand Institute website, press the contribute button, and put a note in there that it's for the Iran Book Show. All right. Thanks for listening. Um, talk to you next week. <laughs>